This is Ben Allen, founder of BC Allen Publishing Group and Tonic Books, a partnership publishing house. We made this interview for you. Why? Because it is our mission to usher into existence the world's next great wave of life-changing, world-altering books. One of those books could be inside you right now. And no writer can go from idea to bestseller alone. No writer has to. Be sure to check out the other resources we've created for aspiring and established authors and the dozens of interviews we've done with some of the world's best, brightest, and most successful New York Times bestselling authors, world-impacting movement builders, and influencers that reach millions of lives. Do enjoy. Okay, I am here with uh, Jason Goldberg, also known as JG. Jason, welcome. Super excited to have you on board. Dude, I'm super excited to be here. You are Ben Allen, a.k.a. B.A. Can I call you that? Yeah, you could call me BA. That's fine. <laughs> All right. So, Jason, I'm going to give you a bio here, and then we're going to go. And I'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions, dude, and we're going to dig in. I, I couldn't imagine like a, a more awesome person to have on this call and, and somebody who's going to be more useful for authors looking to create something and looking to really find the joy in creation. So, so let me give this Thanks, bio brother. and just jump right in. What does an award winning entrepreneur, a TEDx speaker, a baconitarian that's a vegetarian who still eats bacon, a funky sock lover, a former rapper, who opened for the Wu-Tang Clan, yes, really, and a previously 332-pound man who has since lost over 130 pounds despite his affinity for bacon, have in common? They're all the same guy. Jason Goldberg, JG for short, is the king of playful sales, success, and self-leadership. He is a geek turned entrepreneur, international speaker, edutainer, creator of the eight-week life-changing, joy-creating, business-transforming, playful prosperity program, and author of the number one international bestseller on self-leadership, prison break, vanquish the victim, own your obstacles, and lead your life. Dude, okay, so I've got a ton of questions for you. Let's start with your material, uh, your, your book, Prison Break, and I'm going to ask you about the process of that and like kind of what the promotion was like for that book and yeah. uh, all that good stuff. So I have a whole bunch of sections that we could kind of highlight, uh, but I cool. want to hear from you um, a little bit. Just g- give us the kind of broad overview of what that book is. Yeah. So essentially the book is, well, it's, it's really my story and it's really kind of my own guide manual. Well, right. I say, I say it's not an instruction manual, it's a destruction manual. And it's kind of about tearing down all the walls and the barriers and things that I created for myself in my life. Like screw everybody else. Like this is about me and, and what, a, what a, a prisoner I was for the first 30 years of my own life. And it was about me writing, you know, writing kind of my own transformational story and what I've learned about these distinctions that I've come up with of being a self leader in your life versus being a prisoner in your life, being somebody who, uh, who, who makes a choice in any given moment, whether they're going to be a self leader and take ownership of their life, or they're going to be a prisoner of circumstance. And it's something I just became a true expert at, well, at least half of it, the prisoner side, um, by living it for, you know, the first three decades of my life. So through my own inner work and through coaching and through learning, and, and most importantly, through experimenting and applying, uh, I came up with this, this distinction. And it's one that I use on a day to day basis in my own life and with my clients and the audiences I speak to. And so it made sense to kind of write a book that, again, if nothing else, would give me the reminders that I needed uh, whenever I fell into prisoner mode to make that shift back into a more empowered place. Yeah, I love it, man. That, that's what really comes through as well as a, as a reader. That distinction was made um, so clear, and it's a very powerful distinction. Would you give us a little bit of a sense? Because I think that this distinction um, is useful for writers as well. Uh, writers can often fall into this, what you call the prisoner mode, uh, versus the self-leadership um, uh, kind of way of being. So will you give us a couple of distinctions that, that define the kind of prisoner state of mind? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'd, I'd love to say that I'm super smart, but like people know if I, if I just tell them, here's the distinction, right? Either you're going to be an empowered and purposeful and creative self-leader, or you're going to be a deflated, complainy, whiny, pessimistic prisoner. They know what that looks like in their life, right? They felt yeah. that we've all felt that on so many different occasions. And I know one of the biggest distinctions that, come, that came up for me in writing the book and that I see with people all the time, anybody that's in, in, a, in, in creating, right, in creation mode, I think a lot of the things, a, a lot of the things that came up for me and an example of prisoner mode for me was, and I have a chapter in the book about this, is thinking that it was my only line in the play. Right. Mm-hmm. And so when I talk about, there's a chapter in the book called, it's not your only line in the play. What that was, was my prisoner taking over and telling me whatever you're doing now is all or nothing, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever you're creating now, this is the only chance you'll have to create in the entire world. And this is make or break. And if you don't nail it and get it perfectly done, then you're totally screwed and nobody's going to follow you. And you're going to have this horrible career. You're not going to have a career. You're going to go back to some job that you hate and your life's going to be miserable. 
all when I'm just sitting down to write out some of my thoughts for one chapter of one book. And, and so the, the prisoner says, I have one line in the play. And, and what that, that, that metaphor comes from is, imagine if you are in an actual play, like a, a stage actor, and you're, you're off on the, the wing of the, of the stage and you're waiting to come on and you have this one line to deliver. It literally is your only line in the play. It's the most pivotal line in the play. And you getting the words right and, and the diction right and the inflection right and the emotions right will make or break this play now and forever. Do you think that waiting at stage right to come and deliver that line, you are going to be relaxed and creative and in flow and in a place of service? Like, do you think that's going to happen? Or do you think you're going to be like, oh my God, I'm screwed. I'm so stressed. What if I screw up and your life's going to be over? And so that's, I think, the way creatives, and, and when I say that, of course, myself as well, that we approach creation sometimes, that it's our only line in the play where the truth of the matter is that not only do we not only have one line in the play, we literally have every line in the play of our lives. Hmm. And so if you are this same stage actor, and now you have literally dialogue on every single page of a 70 page play, then if you go out on stage and you kind of flub a line or you don't give it the, the exact emotion you wanted, or it doesn't land properly, or it doesn't land the way you want it to, it doesn't freaking matter because you're going to have another line three seconds later, three shows per night for three weeks. And so that one moment doesn't matter as much. And now I can be much more open, much more purposeful, much more creative without all that stress and without me leaking all of my energy over something that's just not true. That's so good, man. That is so valuable for, for writers to hear about. Uh, now, could you say a little bit more about that maybe in the context of a book? Because I think that when folks write books, there is even, they're like, this is my book, right? This is the, this is my one. we we'll say do you know what I mean? They're like, this is the one, uh, the one thing that I've got to, the one chance that I've got to make an amazing book. That's really going to whatever do blank. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree. Yeah. And that's, and, and that happened to me so many times and it's, it's really just this distinction. I know, you know, you and I have probably both heard this from Steve Chandler, a guy that we both just love and, and respect so much yeah. is this distinction of, of ego versus service. Hmm. Right. And, and when I sit down and my goal is to write a life changing chapter of a book, that's going to have people throw, you know, rose petals at my feet, like it's, you know, <laughs> Eddie Murphy and coming to America and, and like, and just, you know, sing my praises from the rooftops. Then uh -huh. I have, I have much, I, I am much less likely to write something that's actually useful to people. Not that I can't, right? There's, there's, I've definitely created things in the world from a place of ego that were helpful. And, hmm. and I did that despite my ego, not because of my ego. So, so sitting down, it's really, anytime I get, you know, quote, writer's block, typically that that's a sign that I'm just an ego, right? Because like if, if one of my friends was in trouble, like I had one of my friends call me and they were crying. If I didn't have anything to say to them, it would be because I'm worried about saying the right thing. Hmm. Right. Yeah, but that doesn't happen right. when you really care about somebody that's in your world and you're struggling, you just love on them. So if I can kind of love on the page and love on the process, then it's so much easier to create. Yeah, that is really, really awesome. And you know what, man, that, that's been coming across the board in all these interviews I've been doing. Uh, and it's something that I strongly encourage writers to do is to, is to lean into service. Like when we're looking at ourselves, right, when we're looking at how we appear, and you've got an awesome chapter about this in particular in the book. Uh, I forget the name of it offhand. It's the one that's uh, um, uh, not every shot is a game winning shot. Right. Yeah. That one's so is very similar to this. I absolutely love that. But yeah, when we're focused on ourselves and we're focused on how people perceive us and you write about this in your chapter and when we're focused about how people uh, like appearing amazing or awesome or awe inspiring or something, when we're self focused, we get all jammed up. And when we're in service, we, we can kind of forget about ourselves and our ego and our appearance. And as you say in that chapter, we can just kind of relax into connecting with somebody else. Yeah. And, you know, and, and even as I said it, and then you reflected back to me, then, then the, like the BS meter went off in my head and I'm like, yeah, but if you're talking to a friend, like the worst that can happen is that you don't say something super helpful, but that friend's not going to then go post on Facebook. Hey, just so you guys know, I was feeling down and I called my best friend and he didn't say the right thing. When we sit down and we, we think about the book and we're like, all right, dude, yeah, great with your best friend. But you know, what if you write this book and, and people hate it or people call you on it or people say, who are you to say this? Like, that's really, I think a lot of the fear, it still comes from ego. But I think that's a lot of the fear. So I don't want to discount and say like, oh, it's the exact same thing, even though really at its core it is. But, but if, we really, if we really slow that down, I think the way to get over that part of the ego is to stop trying to be an expert when we write. 
Yeah. Because, because if I, if I only proclaim to be an expert in one thing and it's my life and how I've experienced it, then I'm okay with people saying whatever they want because just like I'm sharing my experience, they're sharing theirs. So if I go up on stage and I say, yeah, you know, or in the book or, or whatever, like anytime I'm sharing my message and I say about, you know, being 332 pounds and feeling suicidal at times and, and literally contemplating driving my car off a bridge because I was so upset with the human being that I was and feeling so, so low value and somebody raises their hand in the audience or somebody emails me and says, you don't know about anything. My, you know, my so-and-so, you know, did commit suicide or I haven't been able to find a job in five years or my parents died when I was young. Like you don't know anything about what it, what it means to be sad and suicidal, then I can agree with them. And I can say, you're right. I mean, I couldn't even imagine what you went through. And all I'm sharing is my experience of what it felt like to go through my own process of life. Yeah. So then there's nothing to defend against. And so if there's nothing, if I know there's yeah. not going to ever be something to defend against when I sit down to write, I can just say what comes to me and it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's great, man. And that's, that's all about the context in which you're writing. That's about being there of service. And, and like you said, like the kind of taking this humility of like, this is just about my life. This is what I know. This is what my experience yeah. was. Yep. And you still might get haters, honestly. Like, that's just how it goes. Oh, yeah. And, and, oh, yeah. and, and that's part of the, I talk a lot about this with my writers. It's like, when, when people are on the public a stage like this, especially if they have a mission, right? If they've got a purpose and like they're out there trying to help uh, offer something valuable to the world and, and it feels like a calling, they, uh, they're kind of taking this, they have to take on some bravery right? It takes, mm -hmm. uh, you're almost doing it for like, it's, it's, it takes a bravery that has to go beyond just the self because you're putting yourself in, quote unquote, and it's not actual harm, but you're putting yourself in, in the, in the limelight where people can kind of throw stones or shoot arrows or whatever. And that's what happens on the internet, right? There's angry people on the mm -hmm. internet that want to say mean things, but being able to like, I think there's something really empowering about being like, you know, this is part of my mission and this is just going to be part of the par for the course. There are people that, that might say, things that aren't particularly nice. It's true. And, and the beautiful thing about that, when, when I'm not, when I'm in my ego, I get super pissed off and I want to find the most right. intelligent, passive aggressive way to respond to them. <laughs> and, and, and I've learned over time not to do that. I, you know, it's, it's like, do you remember what you're old enough? You're my age. So do you remember war games with Matthew Broderick? I do. I do vaguely. Yeah. Okay. Well, well there was, you know, you're, there was this whole thing about playing a game against the computer. And at the end of the movie, they say the only way to win is not to play the game. Yeah, and, right. and, and, and so that's really the only response for haters. Like if you want to win the hater game, you just don't play at all. So I've gotten really good about not doing that, but it's also a really good thing when you see that because these people, again, when I'm in my super spiritual Zen mode, uh, which happens once in a while, depending on how much kombucha I've had, um, <laughs> I can, I can, I can look at these people and say, thank you for disqualifying yourself as being somebody that's naturally meant to be in my tribe. And instead now opening up a position for somebody who would see the exact same thing that you read that you hated and say, oh my God, thank you so much for finally putting to words what I've been feeling for years. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, say a little bit more about your tribe. Like, what does that mean to you? you know, we talk a lot about building a movement around a book. So, and I think that we're, in, we're using different words for a similar concept. Will you describe your tribe a little bit and what that looks like? Yeah. And it's funny you say that too, man, because you know, at my core, I actually don't love the word tribe though. I use it all the time just because it's one that people seem to get right now. So I'm kind of meeting people where they are. Thing, right? it, yeah. Seth Godin started with the whole tribes thing. And, yeah. and, and the reason I don't like it is because of the, the tribe mentality that it's based off of originally, where if you didn't follow along with the tribe, you were exiled out and then you would die. Right. Uh, and, yeah, and so, yeah. so that, that's the reason I don't like it as much, but in yeah. the empowered version of it, the empowered version is that, you know, Tribes create uh, um, boundaries, not barriers, right? So, so when, there are, when there are boundaries on a playing field for sports, it's to make sure that everybody knows exactly where to play the game. It's not to keep people out. Right. So, so, so the definition of tribes I use is not the one where this tribe has a barrier around it. So we keep people out. No, it's, it's a boundary so that when I raise my hand, this is the easiest way that I can say it. If I went into a networking convention, right. Or a networking event and I hate networking, I hate small talk. I, as much as I love to be on stage and perform, I'm actually a little more of an introvert than an extrovert. I, I'm like standing in the corner waiting for people to come talk to me. So, so networking events are like horrible for me, but but if I were to walk into a networking event and instead of being clever or trying to have an elevator pitch, if I raise my hand and say, Hey, is anybody here a huge fan of the TV show lost? Like there would be a number of people who would raise their hand and we would become best friends right away. 
Like it wouldn't matter. There would be no small, small talk to be made. There would be no like, oh, what do you do? And oh, it's a hot weather we're having, huh? Like it's just immediate. You become best friends. So for me, I spent like the better part of two years trying to figure out how to build my tribe, right? And there's so much out there about building your tribe or, or building a movement, right? Just like you're saying, building a movement, building something around your message. And then I finally realized like maybe a year ago, maybe even less that if me trying to build my tribe was actually uh, counterproductive hmm. because the same way I wouldn't have to build a tribe of people who love lost. All I do is raise my hand and say, Hey, I love lost anybody else. The tribe is already there. The movement is already there. People are just waiting for somebody to raise their hand and say, Hey, is anybody else down with this? Does anybody else believe what I believe? Or does anybody else want to believe what I believe? Or is anybody else kind of skeptical, but they're really curious to find out more about what it is I believe? I'm not looking at the people who say, Oh, I know what you believe. It's crap. And I have no interest to find out more. That's cool. I, I'm not looking for that. But if I raise my hand and say, Hey, I'm just curious. Does anybody else think it's a little too serious out here in the world? Does anybody else think like maybe we have a choice and we don't have to be a prisoner of circumstance? And there's people who are like, oh my God, yeah, I totally believe that. Or, oh my God, yeah, I've totally seen that be successful in my life when I do it. Or, you know, I'm not really sure, but I'm so curious to find out if that's true. My, my tribe, my movement has been created. They were there all along. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I love that perspective, man. It's just a matter of speaking up and raising your hand. There isn't some... Again, you bring this up in your book. It's not like it, you don't need to manipulate people into that. It's right. you just create an occasion for them to like connect and, and to have this sort of human understanding with one another. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's been so funny because something I did, I think it was probably around when I really got this, maybe eight or nine months ago, is I added something into my email list. And anybody, anytime somebody joins my email list, I think the next day or the same day, whatever it is, they get an email uh, from me that is basically my, my tribe indoctrination. Right. And so my tribe indoctrination basically says kind of what we were just talking about, but I finally realized I didn't need to create a tribe because it already existed. I didn't need to build a tribe. I just needed to call them in or raise my hand. And I listed out all these things. It's this ridiculously long email. It's probably like five to 10 pages. I don't even know, like on a, on a word document, it'd probably be that long. So it's just an insanely long email, but it has all these things that says, listen, you are a part of this tribe. If you believe in or would like to believe in or are curious in some or all of the following things. And I just list all these things out that I believe, like I'm not doing market research to see what people, what I'd like people to believe in or what they would sign up for if they believed in this. Yeah. I'm just like, here's yeah. what I believe in. And you would, you would be baffled at how many people read that entire thing and then write me something back and say, Oh my God, yes, I'm so in the tribe. And I thought I was before, but now I know that I'm in like all these things. And it's just like, I just raise my hand and say, this is what I believe. And if you're into it, sweet, we're, we're family now. That's so cool. I really love that. Uh, th that's a beautiful thing. So, th and there's none, there's no uh, um, artifice or like manipulation or like trick to that. It's just being right. who you are boldly. I, I guess right. if, if there is a trick, it, uh, maybe it doesn't even take boldness. I don't know. D does standing up like this take a, a certain level of boldness for you? Uh, you know, it probably did when I started. And now I just don't give a shit because it's <laughs> like, you know, you can either, you can either be loved for being something that you think people want you to be. And then number one, you never really appreciate the love because you feel like it's probably fake. And number two, you're always trying to be careful to make sure you don't show your true self because then you may lose that fake love. Um, or I can just be who I really am and there are going to be haters and, and haters really aren't haters. They just, they're confused, right? Yeah. Or I'm confused or we're both confused, whatever, but none of us are doing anything <laughs> wrong. Um, so, you know, it, it is what it is, but, but what I've recognized about showing up boldly or showing up you know, authentically, right? Authenticity is a huge buzzword, especially in personal growth. And I'm sure in writing as well, like be your authentic self. And, and my definition of authenticity that just randomly kind of came up in a coaching session five or six months ago with somebody. And now I've, I've really been kind of thinking about it more and, and trying to live it more, or maybe not trying to live it more based on what I'm about to say is that authenticity is essentially what is left over when we stop trying to manage people's perceptions. Hmm. That's yeah, it. Nice. Yeah, that's it. So I don't have yeah. to be bold. I don't have to try to be authentic. If I just stop trying to manage your perceptions for a minute, what's left over is me being authentic. Yeah, that's so good. So one of the things that comes through your work, and I'm hearing it now in, in this moment as well, is this kind of like relaxing into things, right? You talk a lot mm -hmm. about, in, in the book, a lot about distinguishing thoughts, and, and thoughts are kind of the source of our, or believing our thoughts is the source of our trouble often. Yeah. Um, and that if we just kind of go back to our innate state to, to just being humans, you know, and, and recognizing our thoughts for what they are, then we're often kind of freed up. 
and I hear that in what you're saying with this as well. It's like, there is, and I really love it and, it, and it resonates like on a deep level, actually. It feels really intuitively true. It's like, your authentic self isn't some strange foreign being <laughs> that you like have to arrive at, right? Like yeah. it's not, yeah. it's, it's just like you said, it's just drop, it's a dropping away of certain beliefs that hold you from just, like you said, they're, they're, they're just perceptions, managing the imagined perceptions of others. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I'm somebody who is naturally very high energy, as you can probably tell, naturally very high energy. I, I talk fast, I move fast, and I'm naturally, and this is something I don't think I've ever said in an interview before, but it, it just it makes sense to say it because it's true and, and I'm feeling it in this moment, is that I'm naturally somebody who is tense. Like if, oh, if you, if, if, if I'm working or I'm doing stuff or I'm running around and you like walk up and stop me and say, Jason, how does your body feel? I would be like, oh, I, I think I'm like flexing my shoulders or I'm like tensing my leg or like, so, so the reason it's so important and the, re the reason I'm telling you this right now is because I, I don't want people thinking like, oh, but he's like some kind of meditative Zen master, which I'm sure they would. Oh, like great. Yeah. Listening to me. yeah. But like, this is the, the reason, the reason I talk so much about being not so serious and, and being a self leader and relaxing into things is because all of those things were never natural for me for the first 30 years mm -hmm. of my life. And, and, and so now it's like the reminder for me and I do this dude, I do this all the time. I do this even. So uh, just a quick little side story. I've always been somebody historically who was afraid of flying, like really like deathly afraid, had to take Xanax before I flew, like really, really afraid. And, and then especially, you know, as my career grew and especially as, as the book came out and I was doing a lot more uh, traveling for speaking and things like that, I was like, well, you know, I really don't want to be zonked down on Xanax every time I go to a speaking gig and, and need like, you know, a half a day to recover just because I'm flying somewhere. And so I said, okay, this is something I really want to work on. And there's a lot of things I did to get over my fear of flying. But now, the most fear I have when I fly, and I just was telling you, I just flew home yesterday from LA, is that I will notice some tension in my body. If there's like, you know, a shake or just something that sounds weird or something's off, and I'll notice that my body's really tense, and I'll do this thing, and I, I did it on the plane yesterday, and, and I do it all the time. Anytime I'm getting stressed out or feeling tense, is I ask myself the question, and, and I'm going to use the word stupid in a rapper kind of context, so you'll have to, <laughs> we, may, we may have to translate if, if possible, um, is that I will ask myself, like, Jason, what if you got, like, stupid relaxed right now? Like, what, what if you just got stupid relaxed? Like, if somebody literally just injected you with horse tranquilizer, what if you got stupid relaxed? So, for translating, what if you just got so relaxed, just so unimaginably relaxed? And as soon as I say that to myself, my shoulders drop, my breathing slows, my mind slows down a little bit, and I'm sitting on the plane, the same plane with the same turbulence and the same weird noises, and all of a sudden I don't feel nearly as stressed or as afraid as I used to. That's and that right. can be translated into the writing process, into the speaking process, into the sales process, into whatever you're doing when you feel tense. Just ask yourself, how, what would it feel like if I got super relaxed and just loosened my grip on whatever it is that I'm holding on to so tightly by 5%? Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and I think this relaxation um, that we're kind of talking about, it's not exactly even relaxation in the sense of like, you're like, like you were saying, zen out, you're not, it's not like you're like zen out in a spa somewhere. But it's right. a relaxing, it's like, it's a moving from a scarcity mindset to a mindset of like, everything is great. Like, it, it, we're, we're in abundance, I don't need to be something else or do something else. Yeah. Like when I when I hear you sharing this, because it's not, and I hear this, I think this is really valuable for writers as well. You don't actually lose quote unquote your edge or your energy. If you are not worried, like you can actually be even more creative, right? If you, if you lose the stress and lose the perfectionism, your natural creativity can kind of come out at a stronger kind of rate, so to speak. So the realization yeah, is kind of this odd, like it is real. It's relaxing of our scarcity thinking, but it's actually like a relaxing into something that's more powerful almost. You nailed it. And, and, this is, and this is the number one resistance to being more relaxed that I had for so many years. And the one that I hear the most from people that I speak to in groups or if I do keynotes, the number one thing is that if, if I'm not super tense, if I'm not super serious, I'm going to lose my edge. Right. I'm not going to be motivated. I'm not right. going to be ambitious. I'm going to give up. I'm going to sit on the couch and eat bonbons and get fat and binge <laughs> on Netflix all day. And, and, and that's just not true. And the majority of the reason people don't know that that's not true is simply because they haven't tested it. But, but yeah. the other thing is, is exactly what you're saying. It's, it's about having a relaxed state of mind. It's, it's like, you know, with sports, with sports players who say they're in the zone, 
right? right? They're, they're in a totally relaxed space. When, when I'm at my best on stage, I'm talking as fast as I am right now, yes. but on the inside, I am so friggin' relaxed and grounded. Like there is mm. nothing that could shake me off my core. So it mm. doesn't mean you start doing Tai Chi in the park every day. It just means that your mind is, you're, you're, you're more mindless than mindful, yeah. right? That's like you don't have a bunch of crap on your mind. Your mind is less in use so that it's open to, to, to experience and create whatever it wants to create. Yeah, I, absolutely, man. I see that. Uh, that makes just a tremendous amount of sense to me. Yeah, and I see it as like, yeah, it's a movement from scarcity, right? When there's that kind of pressure, like to be something else or to do something else or to like get it just right, underneath that, there's a scarcity mentality that's like, I'm going to die or everything's going to go horribly wrong. But like, I, I love what you said there, the mind, say it again, it was the being more mindless, not yeah. Yeah. You know, mindless versus mindful. You know, we talk yeah. about being mindful all the time, but if we talk about, right. you know, ver mindful versus mindful, right? Like, right. you know, it's like, right. it's, it's like you look, look at your yeah. thoughts as being useful or useless, right? So if, if, if there, if there are things that are great for you, then you should use them more often. But if there are things that don't serve you, use them less, that's right? Like right. that's why it's called useless. You should use them less. So the stuff that serves you great, the stuff that doesn't serve you, just let it go. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I really love it. Um, dude, there's so much more we could talk about all this stuff. I, a couple of things I want to get into. Well, that, like I said in the beginning of the call or before we started, there's like 10,000 questions I have for you. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe one thing that would be useful for writers. And then I want to actually just ask you a couple of practical things as well, like some kind of on the court systems type stuff. Of course. How, how would you encourage uh, writers to bring more play into their writing? You know, writers take writing, even people who are aspiring writers who aren't quote unquote a writer, they take it so seriously. And man, I say this, like I was an academic, I studied writing for many, many, many years and people just take it so seriously. Um, yeah. how, how do you, how did you bring that into your own process and how do you encourage others to bring that into their process? Yeah. And I think it's a lot of, of what we're talking about. And, 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 you know, this is, there's a difference between being, uh, being playful as in like, you know, shooting Nerf guns and like throwing water balloons and like all that stuff. Like that's, that's play in one aspect. And then the thing that I'm talking about is a spirit of play. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, the playful prosperity program that I have, you know, the, the word playful, uh, a lot of people advised me not to use it because it was going to have too much of a connotation of being goofy, being silly, being aimless. And again, mm. like I told you earlier, I don't really give a shit. Um, so I used <laughs> it because I wanted to use it. Plus I really wanted my program to, to be called PP so I could make like urine jokes, which was great. <laughs> um, so we're called the PP tribe. If people get too serious, we tell them to take a PP break. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> but anyways, so, so, but, but, that's but, but if you, but if you well, look at the word stop seriousness, it is it's like, that's going to shift somebody. You know, for being serious immediately. I think Tony Robbins has this like weird joke that he makes. It's like whenever you find yourself too stuck in your head, he's like, just scream like, God, I love the way my feet smell or like just something like <laughs> just knock yourself out of whatever you're thinking you're in, you know? I love it. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a great pattern interrupt. And, it is. And so, and so when I, when I look at the word playful and I look at a spirit of play, this is about bringing a sense of lightheartedness to what you're doing, Right. And, and, and it goes again back to being not so serious. Like I can be really sincere. And this is the distinction I love, you know, this serious versus sincere, which originally came from Alan Watts. And I unknowingly stole it. And then one of my students in Playful Prosperity said, hey, you know, you didn't make that up. That was Alan Watts. I'm like, all right, cool. So, so now I, I, will, I will give credit where credit is due at least two more times. Then I'll pretend it's mine again. And, and, and this whole notion of sincere versus serious. And so, again, if you sit down and what you're doing is being a serious writer, well, then, of course, you have no choice but to be super pressure filled and super tense. Yeah. But yeah. if I sit down and I'm a sincere writer, hmm. like it's something I, I care about. It doesn't define me. It's not my identity. But I'm sincere about the fact that there's something inside me I'd like to share. And I'm sincere about the fact that I'd like to give some focused, purposeful attention to this thing that's in front of me for however long that is. And I'm sincere about maybe getting feedback on that or about experimenting and about sharing it. Like I can be a, very sincere without having all the seriousness. So I think maybe just kind of a check-in with yourself, anybody who's writing, when you sit down, say, in this moment, do I feel more sincere or more serious? And, and again, going back to that kind of 5% solution that I love to talk about all the time, if you feel like you're being a little serious, say, what would it look like if I was 5% less serious and 5% more sincere? Like just little by little, start that shift to the other side of the pendulum. And before you know it, again, you've, you've, you've recaptured so much leaked energy that what seemed to be really hard becomes at least 5% more effortless. 
That's awesome. Yeah, it's great. You, you've got this beautiful metaphor in the book too about the uh, uh, how to organize your lightning. Mm. Um, and I hear that in this as well. Uh, uh, I hear that basically through our whole conversation. And just a really quick little synopsis of that. It's like the idea that we've just, we've got all this access to just so much energy uh, within us. Um, and then we don't need to fight it or contain it, but we can, we can learn to kind of work with it in a really uh, uh, healthy kind of uh, uh, natural, organic way. <laughs> natural, organic. I don't mean to sound all hippie on you. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, I, well, I just came back from California. There was quinoa everywhere, so it's fine. Don't worry. I'm good. Quinoa and bean sprouts. <laughs> everywhere. Lululemon pants, just as far as the eye can see. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, dude, I, a couple of practical questions about like building your, you know, okay. So I want to go into this, like the specifics of, we talked about, we're using this metaphor of like, you raise your hand and you say, well, I love Lost. And then people are drawn to you because they also love Lost. You know, in what, what context, authors are always looking to, like, build the kinds of movements and platforms that you have. So, you know, how, are there some, like, technical, uh, technical is maybe the wrong word, but some practical tools that you could offer those folks? Um, the concept, I think, and the mindset is really valuable, but maybe there's also some basic um, systems or something that people could put into place. But, like, where do they raise their hand? You know, is there yeah. that, that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, and and it's you know, and the answer there there are different people who will give you vastly different answers than, yeah. than what I will say. Um, what I will say is that it's a it's a consistency and service based thing over an extended period of time. Yeah. So I, I don't I don't know the uh, the Facebook ad algorithm that builds a tribe of twenty thousand in <laughs> two weeks, uh -huh. uh, and, and and that may exist. I don't know that they would be a very engaged tribe, or they'd be a tribe at all, um, or if they'd just be like a fake user factory that's you know happening somewhere in India somewhere. But but <laughs> but what I know is that for me, you know, I started on this journey of just coaching. I didn't have any intention to write a book. I didn't have any intention of really even being a speaker. Like just I just wanted to work on coaching. Really, it was even more selfish than that. I just love of personal development and loved what it was doing for me and I wanted to find a way to get paid to keep reading mm. and, and so so that was kind of what I wanted to do and Facebook was something that came naturally to me I enjoyed being on Facebook and so I just got really consistent with trying to be of service as much as I could via Facebook because remember I'm not the networking guy I didn't want to go out and meet people in real life I didn't want to go set up meetings and do all this stuff I did some of that and I just hated it and I didn't feel like pushing my comfort zone I said why waste my energy pushing my comfort zone when there is a way that I can serve that doesn't push me out of my comfort zone, right? We're so obsessed with like leaning out of our comfort zones all the right, time. Right. But if I'm really good at engaging and serving people with the written word or with a video or with a, a meme or something on Facebook, why am I pushing that aside to go do what somebody else tells me to do? So for me, it was, you know, four years ago, just getting into a place of trying to share as much as I could. And dude, that started with me sharing other people's quotes, right? Like I, I didn't have anything original to share. I would just come across a quote or a meme that I liked and I would share it. I would get into a Facebook group and somebody would say they were having challenges or something and I'd reach out to see how I could help. Uh, I would get into a paid program and I would do whatever I can to make the leader of that paid program look incredible and spread their work out to the world. Like anything that I could do to be of service to the people around me, even if around me, quote, around me was digital, was virtual, that's what I did. And, and, and then people, when you do things for people selflessly, when you really truly are not looking for anything in return, and I wasn't looking for anything in return, it's just this weird, you know, reciprocity, universal law of nature that it does come back to you. And, and now we're getting real woo woo, but, <laughs> but it does like, it's just, it's impossible for it not to. But the problem is that people, they, they, they contract and collapse that timeline too much. And if it doesn't happen within three months or six months or a year, they say, oh, well, I'm just going to give up. It didn't happen. Huh. And I'm here to tell you that, you know, magic, and this is something that I got from James Altucher, you know, magic, magic is truly just immersion over time. I'm paraphrasing, but, but so magic in your business is not that there's a magic formula. Magic is truly just you being immersed and doing the work over time. Huh. So whatever format feels good to you in a way that you can connect with people and share your message and raise your hand and start calling in your tribe, huh. even if you're not sure what that message is, even if you're not exactly sure what you're raising your hand to say, you could raise your hand and say, Hey, I kind of think I might be into this. Anybody else kind of think they might be into it? Like that's just as valid because you're doing the work, you're engaging people, you're serving people and you're learning at the same time. So whatever, whatever methodology, whatever uh, a forum, whatever platform works for you to show up as effortlessly as possible and engage people, just start doing that now and then be ridiculously consistent.
Hmm. And what does that, what does consistent mean? Weekly, daily, monthly? I guess, does that depend on the context? I think it depends on the context. I think it depends on the content, the type of content, whether it's short term, you know, short, short form, long form videos, images, whatever it is. But it's, it's really coming up with, and I love this idea, you know, of, uh, from Austin Cleon about having a swipe file. And, and, you know, some of the things that people, especially online are worried about is, well, what if I run out of content or what if I don't, you know, what if I can't think of something to post every day? So what I do is, and I've done this for years is anytime I get an idea about anything that could be a blog post or could be a Facebook post or could be a whatever, I will just email it to myself and I have a folder in my email that has all these ideas. And there's literally hundreds. Some of them probably suck and there's nothing that I could ever do to make them even remotely helpful, (laughs) but it doesn't matter because when I'm in the practice of doing that, the funny, interesting side benefit of that is that because I know there's such a stockpile of stuff in that folder, I come up with even more stuff because I'm not afraid of scarcity and I end up sharing the stuff that's front of mind. And so I may not ever go back to any of the stuff that's in that folder, but just doing that got me into the practice of, of capturing and documenting when I have little insights and little things that happen that I may be able to share. So I would say start doing that first and whatever comes to mind, if you think it could be helpful, just share it and, and, and see what it does for people. Yeah, great. And just keep raising your hand. And keep raising your hand and, and, and keep sharing and keep asking for people's feedback. And, oh. and, you know, one of the things, I think you may have been there when I talked about this with, with Chandler. Yeah, like, this you know, was the, just coming to mind. Yeah, the conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, the yeah. number one thing that I think people do wrong on social media, or I won't say wrong, that they do ineffectively on social media, where they could be more effective, is that people treat social media like a monologue instead of a dialogue. Yeah, that's great. That's so good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, give us just a really quick sense of what that looks like, and then we'll we'll, we'll uh, wrap up the call in a minute. But so, what is that conversation versus, or, or what do you call it, dialogue versus monologue? What does that look like? Yeah, so so the monologue is is you post stuff all the time. And you're not exactly, you don't really care necessarily. It's of, of, a, of service. There's a lot of like, everything has to have a call to action. Everything is trying to sell something. Hmm. Um, that, that's kind of a monologue, just shouting at people. If, you're, if you feel like you're adding to the noise, then you're probably a dial, you're probably a monologuer, right? Hmm. If you're just adding to the noise, you're probably a monologuer. But if I slow down and I ask myself, and right now, like what that looks like for me is every day I put out once a day, actually, is all I do. And some people will tell you, you got to put out three times a day on five different platforms. I do once a day. That's all I do right now. Unless something comes to me, right? Spur of the moment. And I just feel like sharing it. That's fine. But I only have a plan of once a day and actually only weekdays, Monday through Friday. Um, so once a day, an internet, uh, a meme comes out. And it's my face and it's a quote from me. And that's what I put out once a day. And there's something in there that I hope will engage people. And the way that I make sure that it's a dialogue is that anytime somebody comments or shares or does anything with that post, I am right there responding to them. Hmm. And, and this is something that so many people, and I've had people that are, that I look up to, I mean, people that are just huge in this industry that have become dear friends of mine and, and who are just like crushing it with millions and millions of followers who tell me like, dude, your ability to stay engaged with your people and respond to every like and every comment and every share and really show people that they matter in the world and that you don't take for granted that they took even five seconds to click the share button or 30 seconds to type something about why it was impactful to them. The fact that you don't take that for granted is one of the reasons you've built the following that you have. And so even if that's only one person or even if all you're getting is likes and people haven't gotten to the place yet where they're actually commenting or sharing it in the very beginning, dude, if somebody likes something, I would message them privately and just say, Hey, thank you so much for liking this. I really appreciate you doing that. It means a lot. And that's, and, and what, and what I did, I'll give you, yeah. And I'll tell you something else I did that I actually forgot about until this moment that was huge. And this is such an amazing, fun thing to do. And I guarantee 99.9% of the people listening to this will not do it. And that is indicative of the 99.9% of people who will not be successful over time Uh is that every single person who signed up for my email list, every single person, I would send back a personalized email with a picture of me holding up a piece of paper that said, hey, Eric, welcome to the family. Hey, John, welcome to the family. Hey, Sally, welcome to the tribe. Hey, Jim, so happy you joined us. I would do that for every single person. And people would write back and they'd say, hey, what's the program you're using to superimpose that onto the paper? And I would write back to them and I would show them the paper ripped in half with the message on it to let them know that this was really me sitting there and writing this. And there are people to this day, there's a guy in particular, there's a guy in particular named Eric who has literally signed up for every program and everything I've ever done who just told me again last week, reminded me last week that me doing that with him three years ago is what made him think, yep, this is the guy for me. I'm following him from now on. That's amazing. 
That's just so good. I, I really love that, uh, Jason. That is, uh, it's playful. It's got the heart of service. It's just, it's what you talk about in the book. It's just connecting with another human being in an authentic way. Totally. Without like some like end goal in mind, but to the, but just to be of service and to be there with them. I mean, it's really amazing. Yeah. Human to human, man. It's, it's something you do beautifully. Like, I mean, anytime I'm around you, I just feel so, so seen and so connected and so cared about. And, and so that's the way you live as well. So I love that about you. Wow. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. That, that, that's a nice thing to hear. Yeah, man. Well, it's all a great disguise, you know? I mean, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just haven't gotten the call to action email yet. <laughs> Uh, and you know, and, and for people who are listening to this too, you know, whether you like him or not, and whether he's controversial or not, and whether you like him cursing or not, you know, look at somebody like Gary V. You know, Gary V. Is I, I have a love hate relationship with him because I don't believe in like the crazy over the top hustle. hustle. Yeah, but, yeah. But 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 I also get that he loves that, so he's not doing it because he thinks he right. should, and, he's, and right. he's not telling you to do it. He's just saying that that works for him. But the way he engages with people and the way he's just so, you know, the whole jab, 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 right hook, just yeah. no, no need for anything in, in, in exchange or return. He's a great model to watch for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Great. I think Seth Godin's daily blogs as well. I don't know if he actually, you know what, I, I take that back because I don't know about the interactions he has with people, but, the, but just for the presence and consistency and connection with tribe, I think Seth Godin's really great with that. And, and that's great too. And, and I don't, I haven't followed him long enough. Like, and he's, he's one of the only people who I am still subscribed to the blog and, and read it every morning. Yeah. Um, but, but I don't know, maybe back in the day when he started, when he had a smaller audience, he was more engaged. And, yeah, and there, awesome. there obviously is a scale question, like how much you can be engaged changes as your business scales. But, but nobody listening to this, I would guess, including myself is at a point where we can't be fully engaged with the majority of people who are engaging with us. Yeah. 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 And if you, and if you do, and if you do believe in the belief that it is too big and let's even say you've got a platform of a million, I mean, we're going to have people that we're interviewing with really large platforms. It still doesn't mean that you can't take this attitude and find a way to do that. Absolutely. Right. Oh, there's so, so many creative ways to do that. Just showcasing or spotlighting one of those people once in a while, right. you know, just like liking something that they comment on or just little things once in a while just builds raving fans for you and they'll go out and tell the rest of the world for you. Yeah. It's so good, dude. I, it's so good. I, I really could ask you questions about this all day. I just think you've got the right approach and attitude and I think it's going to be so helpful to the people listening to this, but uh, Thank you, man. I, I also noticed that we're at uh, the time here. So I want to get a couple of things before I ask for your last bit of advice. Where do people find you? You've got these awesome programs like the Playful Prosperity Program, the PP Program. <laughs> uh, you've, got, you've got just such good stuff that you're doing um, uh, and you do talks a lot. Like where can people find you and find out more about you and what you're doing? Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. And, and, and PP is number one. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I can't resist. <laughs> I, can't, I can't resist. Uh, you uh, probably have a whole archive of these jokes. From you, you, <laughs> you have no idea. And the greatest thing is the people in the tribe have created better ones than I ever could. So, <laughs> so thank, thank God for them. Um, yeah. yeah, so okay. you can go to playfulprosperity.com to learn about that. We, we just finished a round and I don't know when the next live round is going to be, but there's a, there's a wait list there. You can check that out out there. Uh, and my main website is the Jason Goldberg dot com uh jason goldberg.com was taken so i got the most pretentious email <laughs> or a website i could get so it is the jason goldberg.com and uh, and definitely definitely follow me on facebook it's really easy to find me on facebook if you actually just go to www.fbjason.com like facebook jason fbjason.com it'll redirect you right to my facebook page so you don't have to try to find me and then people can interact with you there and i'm sure that you'll connect with them Oh, totally. And if you tell me, if you, if you write something to me on Facebook that you heard me on an interview with Ben, then I will ban you from my page. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that, that I will welcome you with even, even more open arms than I would anybody else. You'll send a little picture of yourself with their name on a, on a piece of paper scratched out while you're flipping off. <laughs> you'll, like go the not, extra, you'll go the extra mile just to tell them to leave. <laughs> that's not bad. That's actually a really good idea. Maybe I'll, for the haters, I'll save that one yeah. for the haters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dude, well, That's uh, and, awesome. then, and then the last bit. So if you could give one little bit of advice to, to aspiring authors, you know, you've done a lot. You've, your book is just out to just tons of people. It's helping you grow your business. Um, you've got this fantastic uh, tribe. You know, if there's one thing you could offer to aspiring authors who want to do all those things that you've done, um, what would that be? Mm. I mean, we've already covered so much that so they don't need any yeah. more. But if there's one no, thing no, no. That, from our conversation that you could re-summarize or if there's one thing that, that's present for you now that wasn't before. 
Yeah, you know, you know what the, the thing that's the most present for me right now in this moment, and it has been kind of lately, and it's probably because I'm giving a keynote on it in a week or two, and so I've kind of been playing with this message a lot, is, is just the, um, the power in just doing the work right? Like just sit down and do the work, right? Like Stephen Pressfield talks about, right? Just do the work. But, but the, the, the shift that I've made around this is that I want people to stop trying to develop a work ethic because awesome. I think work, work ethic gets us in trouble because of the word ethic. And now it says something about our character morally and ethically, whether we put in the work or not. And, and so instead of worrying about creating a work ethic, just create some kind of a success system for yourself, right? And, and to me, a success system is not even necessarily the practices of like, I'm going to sit down for this long. That's great. Like sit down for five minutes, do the work or whatever it is. The success system for me is essentially saying like, listen, guys, I experience every bit of fear and stress and despair and resistance that you face as well. I just don't take it seriously right? Like that stuff all comes up. And the only response that I have for those feelings when they come up is that you're irrelevant. I don't have time to play with you right now because there's something I'm more committed to in creating in the world. So if you can keep that word in your head, anytime you want to take your emotional temperature or you think it says something about you that you're not working as hard or that you should be working harder, just see those thoughts in your head and just say, it's irrelevant. I got work to do and I'm just going to go get to work. That's awesome. Man, thank you so much. Yeah, and work is can actually be like play. I, and I don't mean like totally. in that weird way that's like it's you're just blowing off reality, but it can be um it can actually be a joyous occasion. Absolutely, man. And and you teach that and you live that. So thank you for modeling that for all of us too, bro. Oh, dude, thank you, man. What a pleasure it was to have you on and uh I just really appreciate you. Pleasure's all mine, dude. I love you and I'll talk to you soon. All righty. If you want more interviews like this, Check us out at tonicbooks.online. In addition to other resources, we've made dozens of interviews like this to support aspiring and established authors who want to write, publish, and market their book with ease and impact. For more details, check out the description below.